Well, thank you for that kind introduction, and uh, good afternoon uh, uh, to all of you here. Uh, it's uh, the end of the day, and we're uh, going to do our best, I think, to keep us all awake and on edge with uh, new and emerging uh, challenges uh, to our security. Uh, thanks to Namrata Goswami as well, and to IDSA for bringing me here. It's, uh, it's just a pleasure uh, to uh, be able to consider some of today's most pressing issues with uh, friends and colleagues uh, from around the world. So, as the, as the chair was kind enough to mention, uh, today I'm going to take us on a brief tour uh, of cyberspace. Uh, we'll consider security, we'll consider cyber terrorism, uh, we'll consider what's new uh, coming on the horizon, uh, and why uh, technical issues in particular are often ignored, I think, at our collective peril. And then finally, what India uh, might do in cyber. So, with each advanc advancing year, more novel information technology is brought online, it's simultaneously advancing societal capabilities uh, and our dependence right, on new and legacy systems in areas as diverse as healthcare, finance, entertainment, defense, and critical infrastructure. Uh, despite uh, nearly unceasing news, I'd say, of cyber attacks uh, and various exploits uh, that appear to strike into the nervous system of modern society, Many in the private sector, in particular, continue their long pattern uh, of outsourcing risk, since it's thought that building technology with security first in mind may make it harder to bring it uh, to market or make it less profitable. That's an effect that we're going to uh, look at uh, uh, in some detail. But it's not only new information technology that's laden with obscure troubles. By now, it should be apparent to anyone reading the news that legacy computer systems, on which global communications depend, have fundamental weaknesses uh, waiting to be discovered by hackers, whether they're of the ethical variety or not. So today there's a constant dynamic at play. It's essentially of researchers finding vulnerabilities and acting to plug those vulnerabilities, or criminals exploiting them first in so-called zero-day attacks. Uh, to put this in security terms, uh, many of the people in the room are security experts, if not all of them. The uh, attack surface of our information dom technology dominated society is vastly expanding. Um, and the gains in security, particularly of the technical variety, are too few to cover us. Uh, the reasons for this situation are varied, and we'll explore those. First of all, um, cyberspace uh, is unusual. It's unusual space. It, uh, it poses significant challenges to states. And that's for several reasons, uh, notably four of them. It's uh, development moves at a rapid pace. Uh, we all know that computers, computer technology, uh, Moore's Law, uh, etc., things move at a rapid pace. Another, that there are few international regulations regarding cyberspace. Cyberspace also ignores borders, uh, it, and it does not recognize a difference between public and private spheres. For those reasons, the, cyberspace is a particular challenge to states. Uh, at a commercial level, uh, where the speed of change is well understood, and most of the critical infrastructure and IT research and development resides, there are clear reasons for not wanting to address cyber risk. As I mentioned, it, admitting to risk may be akin to accepting legal responsibility, and in that instance, shareholders, customers may not be keen on your wares. So the outsourcing of risk has become the norm in cyberspace. Additionally, at the legal level, both domestic and international laws across the globe simply are not set to deal with today's technical uh, and rapid change. This should come as no surprise since the law is often reactive. Uh, at the U.S. national level, even for those countries, uh, say even for uh, the United States, uh, as we're updating laws, the best could be sa said is that it's in a state of flux uh, and it's playing catch up with change. Internationally, the situation uh, at the legal side is markedly worse. Uh, though in some regions, halting progress is being made. At the geopolitical level, uh, many countries are hiding behind difficulties in attribution. That's the so-called attribution challenge. Uh, and our chair mentioned uh, in particular this question of uh, who's doing what uh, and, uh, and where, where are the attacks coming from. And that's in part to help accelerate economies through espionage right? or to seek proxies to conduct attacks on foreign policy objectives that uh, may be neb nebulous. Still, other countries don't have the capacity or desire uh, to police their own people. So criminality of one form or another continues uh, essentially unabated in cyberspace. Security flaws, as I mentioned earlier, continue to crop up. 
while new technologies are rolled out and outdated or inadequate laws are applied. That's, that's the basic snapshot that I want us to take away here. So in terms of the rapid technological shifts of the last decade, um, the advent of the information age for the last couple of decades, we could say. One might reasonably wonder uh, why uh, and how so many security risks were allowed to proliferate. The unsatisfying answer uh, is that in many cases, the original design was not built with security in mind. You consider, for example, that the internet was originally intended for a few thousand researchers, not billions of users uh, who don't know or trust each other. And uh, Facebook alone, uh, just to give us one factoid, uh, if it were a country, it would be the world's third largest. Right. So simply stated, the designers of uh, many of these systems placed a higher premium on ease of use and decentralization over privacy and security. They did not foresee, uh, in the case of the internet, that it would ultimately be used for commercial and military purposes and become a haven for criminality. So I'm going to show us a couple images now. Um, this first image uh, is 1977. Uh, this is ARPANET. This is uh, the progenitor of the global internet. Uh, it was initially funded by ARPA. That's the Advanced Research Projects Agency. Uh, it was that's later DARPA. Uh, DARPA is still in existence, as you know. Uh, within the United States Department of Defense, it was used for its projects at universities and research laboratories in the United States. What you're seeing, uh, each one of these uh, little nodes is a essentially a router. It's a type of computer uh, that connected many different terminals. Uh, but all right, we get an idea uh, very quickly uh, that uh, you know it was a fairly small uh, and discrete network. All right. Uh, interestingly, uh, the, the person who thought quite a bit about, um, I don't know if that phone is ringing or, sorry, sorry for that. We had a cyber attack there. So, <laughs> all right. So the uh, person who thought about this often uh, is, uh, is credited uh, as Licklitter, uh, JCR Licklitter in 1963. He discussed the concept for an intergalactic computer network. And I recommend you take a look at this mem memorandum that he wrote in 1963 intergalactic computer network. So in 1970, the ARPANET reached the East Coast of the United States. Uh, thereafter, uh, it grew very rapidly. By 1981, the number was 213 host computers with another host computer connecting every 20 days. Right. Now we move to the internet uh, in 2005. Uh, this graph depicts devices connected to the internet. Uh, it's a, uh, a visualization, uh, and I'll be showing you one uh, visualization that's overlaid on a map. Uh, briefly. Uh, so these graph colors, um, just to give you a quick description, Asia Pacific is in the red. These are computers uh, or networks that are connected together. There are over 50 million points here. It begins to look like a universe. <coughs> I think it's one of the most uh, compelling and brilliant images. I wish I had it as wallpaper. Um, <coughs> Europe in the Middle East is green, North America blue, Latin America and the Caribbean yellow, uh, and then uh, unknown in the white. This gets better over time. So <clears throat> I move to my next image, uh, 2014, map of devices connected to the internet. Right? The image shows here the location of all devices uh, connected to the internet in the world uh, that are done through uh, a technique that I'll describe. So um, an internet cartographer by the name of John Matherly put this together uh, and uh, he pinged, uh, that is, uh, every IP address on the planet and plotted positive responses. Nothing illegal about this approach. Uh, it is simply a network utility which transmits an echo request. Um, the resulting colors show how many uh, devices there are in an area. <clears throat> the redder the dot, the more the devices. The bluer, the fewer. Uh, some areas have no dots, as you see. Uh, there's a single dot in the um, middle of Greenland there. Uh, that's a uh, weather station. Uh, despite the prevailing view that the internet is global, uh, you know, it's also clear that there's a real digital divide and that non-colored areas on this map do not re directly uh, relate to a lack of population. Okay, so we got an idea of where we've come from. Let's consider that at a macro perspective, okay, the threats against IT dependent society are an admixture <clears throat> of hacking, terrorism, espionage, and cyber war. Consider a couple data points. Uh, in the wake of Snowden's revelations, if you want to call them that, there's been a renewed focus on the efforts of intelligence agencies in cyberspace. Under that cover, as I mentioned, many countries are thought to be exploiting loopholes, taking advantage of gray areas for industrial espionage. Uh, North Korea, uh, Iran, China, and Russia are among countries that have cyber military units. 
uh, this uh, sh that are moving into offensive disruption and destruction. That shortlist is being augmented with countries uh, that some might think less likely uh, to be interested in offensive cyber war, such as Denmark. Right? That may surprise people in this room. Uh, Australia, Japan, Israel, not to neglect the United States. So we're seeing quite a bit of change here very rapidly. So what I'm going to describe now is uh, what I think of as a, uh, the merging of the virtual and the physical worlds uh, and, uh, and how that's a, a new emergent uh, technology and trend. Today's technologies, in my estimation, appear to move at speeds that uh, are beyond human evolution. Uh, the futurist Raymond Kurzweil, uh, who, uh, if you haven't read, I highly suggest you do, uh, has suggested that accelerating change, or what in his essay by the same name, uh, he's called the law of accelerating returns, will lead to ever more rapid and disruptive technological change. Regardless of your preferred framework or point of view uh, into today's unstable and dynamic cyber mix, more disruptive and largely unanticipated change is surely coming. One such technology or grouping technologies uh, stands out against this backdrop of otherwise rapid change, and that's the Internet of Things. It promises to bring about a merger of the, vir of the virtual and the physical. It's um, an idea of uh, assigning essentially IP addresses or uh, numbers to all objects and connecting those objects uh, in a smart world. Uh, this merger uh, is underway. It's underway already. Uh, many of us carry phones around. Uh, most of us carry, uh, in this room, I think, smartphones. Uh, we can be said already to be essentially a node in the Internet of Things. Um, we're looking at uh, 25 billion objects by 2020 uh, uh, on the Internet of Things, and there's considerable industrial and governmental mom momentum behind it. Uh, I think unlike uh, a lot of other predictions, this one uh, is, is real. Uh, it's coming. So now we'll move back to risks and security concerns uh, on how they proliferate. So at present, it generally falls on government to consider risks and fend off colossal disasters. Public-private partnership, partnerships are certainly crucial, given that so much critical infrastructure is in private hands. However, a few outside of cybersecurity fields seriously want to consider technological risks, um, particularly because some risks are thought of, uh, if you raise risks, you may be thought of as anti-progressive or pro-regulatory, um, essentially anti-science in a way. Right? But as examples above have shown, society currently faces daunting challenges because too few people in too few places considered risks. Cybersecurity concerns uh, have now been elevated at the top level. Uh, in the United States, uh, President Obama in his uh, most recent State of the Union address, um, a quote from him, he says, uh, no foreign nation, no hacker should be able to shut down our networks, steal our trade secrets, or invade the privacy of American families, especially our kids. If we don't act, we'll leave our nation and our economy vulnerable. Uh, if we do, we can continue to protect the technologies that have unleashed untold opportunities for people around the globe. So at least there's, there's recognition at the political level that the current Internet of people is massively troubled by security concerns, uh, and that something should be done. What that is, I'm not certain. Uh, in addition to the attribution challenges, it's difficult to determine symmetry uh, in, in cyberspace. So um, I'll give you an example. Uh, what, I, what do I mean by that? What would a symmetrical response look like? Uh, this uh, is an example of what would the US do if a country like North Korea were to attack the stock market? Um, would we, given that there is no uh, stock market in North Korea, how would the United States respond uh, to attacking that? Would you drop a bomb? Uh, so these are very real questions that are being played out as uh, these considerations of how do you retaliate? How do states uh, recognize what lines they might must, must not cross? And what's the policy that, that defines what retaliation should comprise? So states are continuing to use this attribution challenge to conduct operations against other countries, and they're also further weaponizing cyberspace, as I described. Um, code uh, of may be used in one place, but it may also fall into the hands of others outside uh, the original operation, and so therefore may boomerang. So there are risks to states beyond being found out uh, for having supported uh, an operation or another. But are these risks being taken seriously by those uh, in intelligence, police, and investigatory institutions? 
And here uh, I'm going to change tact a little bit and talk about uh, some of the bias uh, that I think exists in security professions, uh, and uh, I'll do that through the lens of cyber terrorism. Uh, in 2007, I noted that cyber terrorism of the sort that causes major damage uh, or death through computer attacks had not yet materialized. Terrorists had taken advantage of the web uh, for intelligence gathering, communication, planning, recruiting, fundraising. Uh, and as in the case of beheading videos, frightening people. And whereas just a few short years ago it seemed that terrorists would remain unlikely to engage in cyber attacks due in part to the complexity involved in creating software, times have certainly changed. It's quite a few unsettling trends, but many in the security profession are in denial, I would say, about uh, cyber terrorism in particular. Their critiques are interesting because they fall into three main groups each of which has the benefit of appearing to be based in sound reasoning, however the rationales for each are fatally flawed. The first, what I term the lack of expertise fallacy, right, is based on outdated knowledge and is typically articulated in defense circles by those with markedly limited technical understanding themselves. Uh, the facts are these. Uh, sufficient technical knowledge for physically damaging and terrorizing attacks can be rented. The criminal underworld is awash in reasonably skilled for hire hackers. Custom malware, uh, which is code, can be purchased on the open market. Free courses in hacking are available to anyone with an internet connection. Entire gra gratis hacking suites are available for download. And technical support for criminals as well is never more than a form away. Younger, more tech-savvy terrorists and hacktivists are coming of an age of substantially increased societal connectedness, connectedness and vulnerability. States are actively engaged in weaponizing code, uh, as I mentioned, and they're all too willing to hide behind this challenge of attribution. Right? Many will be apt to share their code with proxies in furtherance of their objectives, just as states continue to support terrorism in the physical realm. Second critique that you hear in the defense and uh, intelligence world is a sort of nothing to see here position. It rests on the suspect notion that terrorists aren't quick to change, they'll just keep using cyberspace for intelligence, communication, recruitment, fundraising, movement of monies, as they did for the attacks of 2001 in the United States and 2008 in India. Yet, uh, adding the delivery of weaponized code to the terrorist arsenal does not alter terrorists' continuing use of the internet for other purposes. And then finally, a third sort of critique is the Doubting Thomas view. It's a regular contender for the most often heard critique of anything new uh, or perceived to be new in the security realm. Challenge really here is one of sussing out what's likely from what's unlikely and the perceived unknown from the possibly unknowable. Clearly evident biases from requisite openness to the new. I think it's very crucial to have critical but not dismissive voices in emu emerging security challenges. Uh, history certainly teaches us skepticism. But it also shows how vulnerable humans are to cognitive bias and how this substantial limitation often precedes disaster. So clearly those for security should now know uh, that objects under computer control and accessible via the internet can be hacked and that those hacks themselves expose new risks. The more we see connected in this space, the more likely the sheer concentration of power will attract cyber terrorists. Um, to give you one example, uh, the FBI is very concerned about something called swarming attacks. Um, they've been concerned about it for years. Uh, it's, uh, in effect, a physical uh, cyber attack, a uh, physical attack, rather, uh, that is coupled with a cyber attack. Uh, so you might see a public emergency uh, response network brought down at just the time that a bomb occurs. Uh, and unfortunately, it's rather easy now, uh, we know this because research ha researchers share this sort of data, uh, to imagine doing things like bringing down emergency networks or bringing down the, making all lights red in a city. Uh, this isn't uh, just Hollywood. Uh, this is reality. Eugene Kaspersky, right, co-founder and chief executive of uh, Kaspersky Labs, recently said, it's not easy to predict what will happen, but the worst terrorist attacks are not expected at present. So I'm afraid that if we face cyber terrorism, it will be very unpredictable, a very un unpredictable place, but with very visible damage. Unfortunately, there are many possible victims. So I think uh, one takeaway I'd like us to consider is that it's, it's crucial to grasp that the likelihood uh, countries are going to experience real cyber terrorism of the sort that kills and frightens people, not simple virtual defacement of website or down banking systems or media companies uh, that are unable to deliver their wares. 
Uh, these are going to come about through increased reliance on cyber as a tool of power, state power, continued ability to obfuscate in, cyber sp in cyberspace, and the use of terrorists as proxies. So we need to contend with this massively changed risk landscape. Now let me move to India in particular here. So wither India. Uh, of late, uh, India has made considerable cybersecurity strides, most notably in 2013 with the National Cybersecurity Policy. Many critics uh, up to then had noted that India had no cybersecurity policy. Uh, however, a survey of the policy literature currently shows that the single most common critique is that the 2013 policy has not yet come into real effect. It's natural. It just happened. Uh, last year, the government of India uh, made, uh, through its uh, Department of Electronics and Information Technology, a detailed policy announcement regarding India's plans for the Internet of Things. Uh, it's a very positive development as far as I'm concerned. Very little in there, however, about security. Um, quite a bit about the economic value of the Internet of Things. So others, though, uh, you know, as I, as I prepared for this conference, uh, you know, I saw that many contend that India remains the, uh, behind the curb on cybersecurity, uh, in particular on uh, the notions of cyber war. There is momentum, uh, though, uh, at least an understanding. As of 2014, India had four agencies to deal with cybersecurity. Uh, additionally, in 2010, the United States and India signed a counterterrorism cooperation initiative uh, to provide cybersecurity and critical infrastructure protection. And that's been strengthened most recently through the Obama-Modi uh, meeting and uh, defense framework agreement, which the White House, I recommend you take a look at that. Um, India and Israel have also signed willingness to cooperate on cybersecurity matters. All right, I've given you quite a bit to digest. The history, uh, one example uh, of cyber terrorism as a possibility, uh, why it's difficult for people uh, in the defense uh, and uh, intelligence world to grapple with new, uh, new things. And now let me talk very briefly and wrap up uh, with uh, what to do. Um, don't have all the answers, and I won't pretend to have all the answers. I think the audience probably has uh, you know, many uh, experts here that can make just as good suggestions as I might be able to. So I look forward to those in questions. So we face cross-boundary security challenges. Uh, that's, that's clear. Uh, we've been hearing from uh, people today and yesterday uh, on issues that are uh, precisely on these issues. I rank cyber and environmental issues among the most pressing. Um, we heard uh, yesterday from one of our colleagues that a world-centric paradigm is needed. And that's clearly the case with information and communication technologies. They're cross-boundary. It's a struggle, and I would argue a, a, a Sisyphean one, uh, that states are involved with when they try to push and contain global challenges exclusively on their own using the tools of state and concepts of sovereignty. So at a minimum, states would benefit from multidisciplinary teams of scientists and social scientists working together to anticipate challenges. At present, too often, scientific and technological concerns are treated as something outside of normal state functions, or only considered in a security context when something goes badly awry. These shortcomings make it extraordinarily difficult for states to anticipate change and best position their peoples for the future, and for states to work together to tackle global challenges. In the world of security, surprise is generally unpleasant. States therefore pursue vast intelligence efforts, and yet even there I think it could be safely said that science and technology issues uh, and their capacity to surprise are treated as, at best as infrequent and, when present, unwelcome interlopers in state affairs. Throughout the 20th century, a pattern developed a massive change brought on by scientific and technological revolutions. Precious few consequences of these developments were anticipated by thinkers working for the state or in the international sphere. Reactions to science and technology developments became the norm, so reacting to them. And in parallel, science and technology retained its status as a sort of magic, uh, something to be considered only by those in the sciences. So I'd, I'd want to argue here that it's realistic for states to get ahead of security challenges of the sort that I've described, or at least to better anticipate them. A strategic culture may be required, but most importantly, with science and technology issues, there needs to be a progressive mix of expertise working at the highest levels to inform the state. In this, India has many advantages. Right? Considerable strategic reserves in science and technology, education, in NGOs and think tanks such as IDSA, uh, in, the, in the people uh, of India. High list, holistic, high-level strategic thinking on the nexus of security, science, and technology is today's imperative. So I argue strongly for a new cadre of technologically savvy analysts, 
to press the case for a deeper understanding of today's challenges and tomorrow's looming surprises. The sooner we work together to overcome biases, outdated thinking, and misguided conservatism, better apt we'll be able to plan for what's probable and plan for resilience and a more secure world. So with that, I thank you. Thank you very much. Um